So it is still Mushroom Month and we are still celebrating by talking about 30 different types of lesser known mushrooms. This is video three in a three part video series. If you missed the first two, you can go check out the previous one here, which will also link to the first video. Now I had a tough time narrowing this down to only 10 different species of lesser known mushrooms, but I think I picked some pretty good ones. So let's jump right into it. Most everyone has heard of Amanita muscaria. It's a real superstar of mushroom and it's the one that's on my shirt right now. But there are actually lots of other cool species of Amanita that are super neat to find. One of which is called Amanita rubescens, also known as the blusher. And it has a unique property where it turns red or pink or starts to blush when it's cut or bruised. Other than the blushing, it actually looks quite similar to Amanita muscaria. But here's the interesting part. The blusher is considered to be an edible species of Amanita. And it's not the only one. In fact, there's also Caesar's Amanita or Amanita Caesarea, which looks again similar to the fly agaric, except it doesn't have those white dots. But in my opinion, eating anything in the Amanita genus is definitely not for beginners. And even if you're a pro, it's probably one to avoid. Although the Amanita genus does contain some edible mushrooms, it also contains some of the deadliest mushrooms, like Amanita phylloides or the death cap, and the destroying angel. So it's not something to be taken lightly. I should also mention though, the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria does have some really unique and interesting compounds that are currently being studied for potential medicinal benefit. That topic, however, deserves a dedicated video, so we'll have to do another one for that. This next mushroom is one that is hard to spell, but it's easy and fun to say. It's called Rushula shrimpulina, and it's also easy to remember because it really does smell like shrimp. I'm not really an expert in Latin, so I'm not sure if a name that starts with an X is supposed to sound like shrimpulina, or if that shrimp is done on purpose, but I'll take it. It's also sometimes called the crab brittle gill, and that term brittle gill is distinctive of the Rushula genus. Rushulas in general have this unique property where the entire mushroom is brittle or chalky. One of the best ways to tell if you're dealing with a rushula is to snap the stem and you should hear an audible crack and the rest of the mushroom should just break into pieces quite easily. Rushula shrimpulina is considered to be one of the most delicious rushulas with a very distinct taste, but as a whole, I generally wouldn't recommend looking for rushula mushrooms, especially if you're a beginner because not all of them are edible. Some of them might be confused with other potentially poisonous species, but that doesn't mean it isn't cool to find a bunch of rushulas and to show your friends how you know it's a rushula by the fact that it breaks into a million pieces. This next mushroom definitely gets more attention than it deserves. And to be honest, I would probably ignore it too, except for the fact Fact that it's always the first mushroom to show up in the spring. So after a long winter, I'm always super excited to find Verpa bohemica, also known as the early morel. Despite the name, it's not actually a morel mushroom, but from a distance, and if you're being overly enthusiastic, you might think that it does kind of look like a morel. It has a similar looking wrinkly cap, but if you've seen the difference once, you'll never mix up the two again. But here's the interesting part. A lot of people consider Verpa bohemica to be inedible. And the reason for this seems to be from an earlier guidebook that showed some anecdotal evidence or had some examples of people eating the mushroom and getting kind of sick but there's nothing actually in the mushroom that would say it's inedible when you compare it to something like a true morel mushroom which is obviously a gourmet edible mushroom as long as you cook them thoroughly so there seems to be some mixed signals on the edibility of this mushroom depending on the guidebook or even the group that you happen to be foraging with i can tell you though i have tried verpa bohemica from alberta and in my opinion, they're not all that great. Sure, they are edible when you cook them and they taste not too bad, but they're nowhere near as good as true morel mushrooms, which show up just a week or two later. So I'm always more happy to wait for the actual morel mushrooms and not eat the verpas. If you're watching the video this far, first of all, thank you. Second of all, it probably means you like mushroom content. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Also, when you're down there, if you can also hit that like button, it really helps the channel grow. Perhaps the most showboating of all the mushrooms is something called Phallus induciatus, or the bamboo fungus. Eventually it looks super cool, but it doesn't look all that special at first. It starts off as a little hairy goo filled egg, but eventually that will crack open and a giant phallic shaped fruiting body will burst through and grow tall and eventually drop down this beautiful net. And that net is to attract insects. Also it doesn't smell that great. So insects are naturally attracted to it and it will spread the spores far and wide. Now this net looks like a veil, which is why this mushroom is also sometimes called the veiled lady. 
What's really surprising about this mushroom is just how fast it can grow. It can go from a nondescript egg shape into this beautiful veil shape in just a matter of hours. This mushroom grows in the wild, but it can also be cultivated where it grows on manure rich substrates. And it's the net part that is actually harvested and dried and then used in things like soups and other dishes. Next up is a mushroom that to be honest, I'm not 100% sure exactly what it is. I had thought that it was a species of Trimidomyces because it has this really cool feature that when you pull it out of the ground, it has a tap root that just keeps going and going and going and going. Isn't that cool? Termitomyces were thought to be not cultivatable, at least not by humans. They can actually be cultivated by termites, which is where they get the name. This taproot feature emanates from a central comb that's made up of the excrement of termites, and eventually it will grow up and form the mushroom fruiting body. And some of these species can actually get really big. One of them, known as Termitomyces titanicus, can form these massive fruiting bodies that can get up to one meter in diameter. So the question is, is this one actually Termitomyces? At the farm that I was visiting, this was brand new. It was a brand new cultivar and they had just figured out how to grow it. One of the secrets seemed to be the really sandy substrate, which seemed to be a really big feature in how this thing is actually cultivated. But because of the language barrier, I was unable to determine exactly what the process was and exactly what species was being grown. Someone mentioned to us in a comment on a previous post that it's actually a species of Udamanciella, but I honestly don't know and I can't find a lot of good information on this mushroom to see exactly what it is. That being said, it was still super cool to see. It's a really interesting and unique cultivated mushroom and it is delicious. I did try it. You find this mushroom, they'll typically cut off that taproot feature and you can eat it in hot pots and all other different varieties of dishes and it's actually really good. So hopefully we can learn more about this mushroom and might start to see it around more often. With a name like corn smut, this next mushroom doesn't sound too appealing. And in my opinion, it doesn't really look all that appealing either. But the fungus known as wheat lacoche is edible. It's considered a delicacy in some places where it's added to quesadillas and other tortilla based foods. It has a unique pungent earthy flavor that unsurprisingly tastes a little bit like mushrooms and a little bit like corn. It also has a high protein content, apparently one of the highest of all the edible mushrooms and when eaten together with corn actually forms a complete protein. The species name is Ustalago midas. It's a pathogenic fungus that infects healthy corn kernels causing them to swell up into these gross looking blobs. It occurs naturally on corn crops and if you didn't want it, it can actually be hard to control. Sometimes smut infected crops are actually destroyed. But since it's considered a delicacy in other places, this smut infected corn can fetch even higher prices depending on where you're at. Wheat Lacoche is a great example of turning mushroom lemons into mushroom lemonade and you should definitely try it if you ever get the chance. <clears throat> I am Sarkodon, they call me Hawkwing. I got spiny little teeth on my under thing. And no, I didn't come up with that little ditty. It's actually on a song about Sarkodon Imbricatus by Larry Evans on the album Fungal Boogeyman, which you should definitely go check out. The song continues, I eat needles and wood all winter long and it's good. So when it rains in June, I'll be in your neighborhood. And that's where you'll find them if in fact your neighborhood happens to be in the mountains where I find Sarkodon a lot. This mushroom is also called the Hawk's Wing and that's actually kind of what it looks like. The Half of it looks very much like a hawk's wing and the underside is very spiky as he said in the song the mushroom has spikes or teeth instead of gills. These mushrooms are edible, although they're not all that great. They're kind of bitter. And the thing that's great about them is you can find them in such huge quantities, depending on where you're looking. So again, they grow in the mountainous areas and areas with lots of pine needles. They grow on wood and they're pretty obvious when you see them to know exactly what they are. So Sarkodon may be not the most exciting mushroom, but if you can find them, they're easy to identify. And at the very least, you can break out the Sarkodon song. We all know about button mushrooms, the mushrooms that you see at the grocery store. And that species is Agaragus bisporus, which covers Cremini, Portobello, and any of the other cultivated button mushrooms that you might see. But you might not know that there are a bunch of other Agaragus species that grow in meadows, that grow in the wild, that are very close and very similar to the cultivated variety. 
Around here, there are two that grow. That is Agaragus campestris, also known as the meadow mushroom, and Agaragus arvensis, also known as the horse mushroom, both of which are very similar to the cultivated variety. These are super cool to find, and I always love finding them because it almost just feels wrong to see a free button mushroom just growing in a field. And Agaragus mushrooms in general, as a genus, are very distinct looking. And once you see a bunch of them, you can easily recognize them from a long ways away as an Agaragus mushroom. Even though there are a lot of lookalikes, they just have an agaricus feel to them, and once you start to identify them a lot, you can recognize them easily. All that being said, I generally do not recommend to wild harvest agaricus mushrooms because there could be potentially poisonous lookalikes, not just in the agaricus genus, but also in the Amanita genus that might have some mushrooms which are dangerous to consume. Combine that with the fact that they are cheap, they are easy to find at basically any grocery store any time of year, and you'll pretty quickly realize that it might not not be worth it to wild harvest agaricus mushrooms. Still, they are awesome to find, even if nothing else but to just admire them. Next up is a highly sought after mushroom that as far as I can tell, cannot be cultivated. It's called Matsutake, or the pine mushroom, and it forms a mycorrhizal relationship with pine trees, which is why it gets the name. And there is a high demand for this mushroom for culinary purposes, especially in Japan, where they will wild harvest it, but they will also import this mushroom that has been wild harvested from Canada Canada and from the United States and from other places. That's why you'll see groups of people that actually make a living following the season of this mushroom up the west coast where they can harvest it and depending on the seasonal demand can sometimes sell it for quite high prices. As far as being a delicacy, the flavor of this mushroom has been described from everything from cinnamon to woodsy to pine tree-like to rotten earth and a whole bunch of things. It's really hard to kind of nail down what the flavor of this mushroom is. But if you've ever tried pine mushroom or matsutake, let me know in the comments below what you thought of the flavor. So we know that some mushrooms can grow in the dark, but did you know that some mushrooms can glow in the dark? Yes, it's true. And in fact, there's over 80 different types of what are known as bioluminescent fungi. Basically mushrooms or fungi that can glow in the dark. One of the most commonly found and also the one that I want to talk about today is known as Pinellus stipticus. It grows on decaying logs and little clusters and it's really not all that interesting except for the fact that it really does glow in the dark. This one is saprophytic and can actually be cultivated, although since it's not edible and it's not medicinal, there really is no good reason to grow it. It's simply just a novelty, but it really does glow in the dark, which is super cool. I have actually cultivated this one before just to see what it was like, and the picture I took of it was less than impressive. It's just barely kind of glowing, but maybe I was taking the picture at the wrong time because apparently this mushroom becomes more luminescent the closer that it gets to sporulating. And the reason reason for this is possibly because the purpose of the glowing is to attract different insects and bugs and perhaps animals that would be attracted to the glow and would get the spores stuck to them and help spread the spores all through the forest so they could continue to propagate the species. So next time you're walking around in the woods and you see what looks like a radioactive log, it might just be this super cool mushroom known as Pinellus stipticus or one of the other 80 different types of glowing fungi. Of course, there's plenty more to cover. We only covered 30 mushrooms out of the tens of thousands of different species. And even on those 30, we didn't really go as deep as we could have gone, but it's late now. So maybe in future videos, we'll cover a lot more mushrooms or go deeper on some of these species. But I really hoped you liked this series. If I missed any of your favorite mushrooms, or if there's something that you want me to talk about in the future, make sure you comment below and let us know what we missed. But until next time, thank you so much for watching these videos and we'll catch you in the next one.